Okay, good morning everybody. My name is Germán Garcia. This is subject MMA 702 Time Series Analysis, uh, Lecture 1. Financial Time Series Analysis is concerned mostly with theory and practice of how uh, the value of different assets change over time. There's a, there's a fundamental difference between time series analysis and financial time series analysis, and it's related to uncertainty. Due to business being an ever-changing world and the economic environment being pretty unstable and depending on many factors, it means volatility is not something that can be directly observed. It's more of a, more of a calculation we have, to, we have to take into account. Okay, for objectives of this course, the first one is to access financial data online and to process the embedded information. This is what R is going to be mostly used for. For the second one, I want to provide rich knowledge of financial time series data, such as skewness, symmetry or heavy tails, and measure of dependence between different asset returns, or even the same asset return on, the, on different moments in time. Third one, introduce statistical tools and econometric models useful for analyzing this series. And I want to, of course, to gain experience in analyzing this, this series. Introduce recent developments in financial econometric and their application. This, is, this goes all the way to lecture six, seven with the high, high frequency finance, which will be pretty useful later on. Six, to study methods for assessing market risk, credit risk, and expected loss. This might be the biggest one, honestly. Methods discussed will include value at risk, expected shortfall, tail dependence. And for the last one, to analyze high dimensional asset returns, including co-movement. This, this is going to allow to, to discriminate pretty well. Now we have some examples. The first one is daily log returns of Apple stock, the VIX index, CDS spread, the quarterly earnings of Coca-Cola. I'll leave you with a few seconds of each. Now, moving for the outline of this course, uh, things we're going to be to be studying. May, um, first and main one: returns and their characteristic. We will be with uh, we will be doing some summary statistics in this uh, this kind of empirical analysis of data. We will be studying simple linear time series models and their applications, univariate volatility models and their applications as well. This is an erratum. Non-linearity in level and, volat and volatility of, of asset returns. We will be seeing neural networks. We're going to study some uh, non-parametric methods. We're going to be taking a look at high-frequency financial data and, micro and market microstructure. Continuous times models and derivative pricing. This will this will include a bit of a bit of real analysis. Spoiler alert. We will be seeing value at risk, extreme value theory, and expected shortfall, which is also it's also known as conditional value at risk. We'll see why in lecture seven. And analysis of multiple asset returns, namely, namely factor models, dynamic and cross dependence, and cross section regression, fundamentally. Now, f first, first and foremost, given a given PT. The, the price of an asset at time t, and we assume no dividend. Our our return is defined as uh, as the quotient between the between the price at time t and the price the previous time we measured it, which is the this p t minus one. Here we will call it like this because this is this can be this can be seen as a proportion or a percentage of some of some sort, so we can. We can define it like like one one plus RT, and we have this this nice equality. For a simple return, this R this R sub T will be called return. In case of a simple return, we just move the one over there, 
and we have this this nice equality. If you're working with a simple return over multiple periods, we're going to use this uh, this equality over here, in which the return rate after k periods of time is the the price measured at, at time t divided by the by the price measured k steps before. So we multiply and divide by all these uh, intermediate prices, and then apply this 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 cool and nice um, equality here. So we get this this really nice product. You may be wondering why this is going to be so useful. Well, um, we, we'll get to that. For now, let's see let's see an example. This is how k period simple net return is measured. Pt divided by Pt minus k minus one, and in this um, in this example, we see daily closing prices of Apple stock in December 2015. The one day gross return from the 23rd to the 24th of December is basically the ratio between the prices. So the daily simple return is this. 0.53%. Now, um, the time interval we're measuring is not only important, it's instrumental. So this is one of the first things we will be, we will be caring about. Uh, default, uh, default time interval is always one year. Now we can, we can extend and suppose we are, we are working with a a random a number k of intervals. So the the, the analyzed net re, net return after k periods can be measured by this super nice formula, which can be approximated, but something that is even more simple. Okay, uh, this will be more accurate. The greater the value of k is, and that's due to well this. How this exponent works. Now, for for continue for continuously compounding interest, we can illustrate this with this uh, with this with this nice table. And here, calling R the interest rate per annum, C the initial capital, and the number of years. Our our present value A can be calculated like this. Why the exponential? Well, the exponential comes from these sums, all right? So if you want to calculate the present value given the, what's the word? If you want to get the, the yeah, the present value C given the, the final value A, what we, what we are going to do is just divide by the exponential of R divided by N, and this is what we get. Now, Regarding the returns, one thing one thing we can we can always do is define this this uh, small r of t, basically the Neperian logarithm of, of one plus r t, which is Neperian logarithm of p t divided by p t minus one. We can we can split that into a difference of two logarithms and name it small p sub t and small p sub t minus one. So for this multi-period low return, what we have here is basically the return after k period becomes the logarithm of all these products over here. We can we can split it into into sums because that's what that's what logarithms do. And what we have is that the logarithm multi-period return after k steps is basically the logarith the logarithmic return on all previous steps sum basically so we once we have log returns we can just sum them and get them over uh, bigger amounts of times this case now if, if we go to to the upper stock price table this one The, the, log, the logarithm return is logarithm of the of the first price minus logarithm of the second one. And that's 
minus 0 0.529 percent and about the other one let's see if i can take this this small window out because it's a bit bothering now if we take it all along all along the six days well we just have to remember this nice formula here or we can say t minus k here as well so log, so log, log return in all these six days is basically ah I, 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 i'm sorry guys i want to move the mouse but it's time i move the mouse the this this small uh, screen appears and it's a bit bothering but well uh, we, we, we get it thing is uh, we can we can use uh, we can use the, the initial price to get the return estimations with extreme ease. Now, if we have n assets, we can we can define this 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 return after t steps as a sum with certain weights omega. For example, our investor holds stocks of IBM, Microsoft, and Citigroup. We assume the capital location is 30, 30, and 40 percent respectively. So we can we will use monthly simple returns in table 1.2. And we, we wonder about the mean simple return of the stock portfolio. Okay, the About the mean, this is how we calculate a, a, a weighted mean with 30% capital allocation, 30% capital allocation, 40% capital allocation, and the corresponding simple return. And we get an average return of 1.66 for this portfolio. Now, uh, we've been talking about what happens if we don't have dividends. But what happens if we do have dividends? Well, if we do have dividends, the the return, the net returns, have to consider this these dividends in the sum. All right. So our our log return is basically the logarithm of the initial price plus the dividend minus logarithm of the previous price. In this case, we have. An excess return. What what we can do is define this this amount this amount sev, which is basically our return asset minus a certain a certain amount being being that amount the the net return at point zero to cover up from risk. This makes of course a, a small a small set defined in the in the same way. So, in in few words, logarithmic return is the logarithm of one plus the return. The reason why this works like this is because the logarithm of a number between zero and one tends to minus infinity, and that would mess up a little bit the calculations, especially with computers. And so we can turn this thing around and so the net return is the exponential of the logarithmic return minus one which is this one answer coming here now if the returns are in percentage then we have these nice expressions which which basically means we have to return the we have to consider that the, the percentage means divide by 100 and that's and that's mostly it now if we remember from five minutes ago if we have the net and logarithmic return over k period we have this nice relation when the when one plus the net return after k period is one plus this return plus one plus the following return and I mean all these products. So once we we take logarithms, 
it becomes the sum of the logarithmic returns. This is really important. The, these two relations are, are instrumental because it, it can happen that, uh, that a random variable with, uh, with our net returns is pretty complicated to, to handle, but the corresponding, uh, the corresponding logarithm uh, is, is actually pretty easy. So being able to change from one to the other is going to be really important. In order, to, in order to see that, we're going to start with an example. If the monthly log returns of an asset are this right here, well, what's the corresponding quarterly log return? What do we do? We sum. So we, we're looking for the logarithmic return after the three months. So we will go for logarithm return in the first uh, in the first month, logarithmic return in the second month, logarithmic return in the third month, and then we'll sum them together. So our quarterly log return is 7.89%. Okay, for another one, now with simple returns, we have these simple returns, 4.46 minus 734 on 10.77, what is the, cor the corresponding net return or simple return? Okay, we will use the, this, this formula above. And in this case, we will just take this one and put it here to use the calculations. So we take one plus this, which is, remember, div divide by 100 to, to take the percentage of, times one, when one plus this percentage that we all know to be negative times this right here we calculated we have for the simple return of 7.21 percent now i talked about random variables and distributions so uh, what is the distribution of this what's the distribution of a of a return variable basically in order to in order to to look for that we're going to start talking about the moments okay the moments of a random variable of any random variable with a, with a density function f of x are defined as the as the mean or the expectation of the variable x to the power of l if the if f if function f of x is continuous this is defined with, with this integral over here, from minus infinity to plus infinity of x power of l times f of x. Of course, the first moment is the classical arithmetic mean, but if the, if the distribution function is not discrete but continuous, we have to use the integral form instead. And for the central moments, the central moments are the expectation of the variable minus arithmetic mean to the, power, to the power of L, they are calculated in the same time. And why are those, why are this important? Because the second central moment is the variance of the variable. That's extremely important. Why? Because one of the fundamental statistics we are using is a standard deviation, which is the square root of variance. Now, there are Consider uh, the variance to be called sigma square sigma square of x. Now, two two more important moments are skewness, which is related to symmetry, and kurtosis, which is re related to fat tails. We will we will see what that means graphically. Kurtosis is the expectation of x minus the mean to the power of three. I mean the third central moment, but here it's divided by by sigma, by sigma cube, standard deviation to the power of three. And kurtosis is the same, but with exponent four. It's the fourth central moment divided by this. So uh, what out of this? Uh, to begin with, kurtosis is generally is calculated with this, this coefficient, this case of x coefficient minus three, that's called excess kurtosis. We will see, we will see why. So Three questions. First one, why should we study the mean and variance of return? 
well, uh, they are concerned with the long term return and they're concerned with the risk related to the variance. Uh, a return variable with, uh, with a lot of variance is not really reliable. Question two, why is symmetry important? Well, asymmetry has important implications in holding short or long financial positions, in risk management. I mean, in a, if, if you have a symmetric distribution, which you can, which you can calculate is, for example, a, a, a normal curve, and you, and you see that, that your returns are starting to ramp up, that can condition your strategy to, to, to keep your investment there until it starts ramping down. And finally, why is kurtosis important? Well, uh, kurtosis or fat tails is related to is related to volatility, is related to efficiency, and it's uh, yeah. So now we have some some old old school formulas. Here we're going to assume um, our data is. Uh, a set of t returns x1 to x of t, and this uh, we have seen we have talked here about uh, mean variance symmetry kurtosis. We're going to talk about sample coefficients. Sample coefficients are all the same. I mean they are calculated mostly in the same way, but in the case of variance, skewness, and kurtosis, we have to divide by the sample size minus one instead. Furthermore, if we assume that um, what's the word? Yeah, if we assume so that our population x1 to, to x of t is is normal, it can be defined by normal distribution. Then uh, skewness also follows a normal distribution, and okay, wait, and kurtosis minus three, not kurtosis, but kurtosis minus three is a normal distribution as well. This is why we're using excess kurtosis. Like uh, the excess in fat tails can be modeled with a normal curve. That's huge. That's huge, boys. So now we have talked about if our population is normal, but how do we test normality? All right. First of all, we need big uh, big numbers of people, big populations, otherwise it doesn't even make sense. But in those cases, we have a symmetry test. Symmetry test is defined in this uh, S superstar variable, which is kurtosis, no, it's skewness, divided by square root of six divided by t, that's normal zero one. So what can you do? Uh, here, this test, we, we use as our null hypothesis, that the distribution is indeed symmetric and we reject it if the absolute value of this is greater or equal than the corresponding value for the normal distribution to half of our level of signification or if you're used to working with p-values if the corresponding p-value is less than alpha where alpha is again our significance number we reject it. For, for tail thickness, we can we can use a similar test, being that uh, our variable k, k, uh, k superstar, I mean, kurtosis, excess kurtosis divided by square root of 24 divided by t is equivalent to normal 0, 1. So we can, we can assume a null hypothesis of normal tails. And we can reject it if it goes, what's the word? If it goes beyond this, uh, the corresponding value in the, in the normal distribution table for our level of significance divided by two, or if you're used to working with p-values, if your p-value is less than the, than the significance level, than the significance number, we reject it and we, we will say our distribution has fat tails. Now, conjoint test. We have talked about normal distributions, but there's always 
there's always a place of honor for t square distribution so uh, k star squared plus Kurtawasi star squared are equivalent to a t squared distribution with two degrees of freedom this is uh, this comes from another uh, a more general statement in which the t squared can be can be built from two normal curves and so we have a t squared distribution with two degrees of freedom. So uh, normality, uh, normality in the, in the in the distribution, we can assume it as our null hypothesis and reject it if this value, I mean the, the value of the distribution, is bigger than the corresponding value of the t squared curve for our significance level alpha, or if our p value is less than the significance level. I mean, remember that the that, that the p value is actually the, the probability that the that the value we're measuring falls out of the curve, mostly. So we're going to start talking about empirical properties, things we can manipulate. In order to, to do that, we have to, to access data from certain sources. We can use package quant mode in R. If you have the some some relevant databases, however, um, most of most of the data, if I remember correctly, is in Canvas. Otherwise, it should be in one of this uh, one of these for for web page from there using using different packages for example quant mode you can you can download and import the data so empirical distributions of asset returns tend to be skewed to the left with heavy tails and have a hair pick the normal distribution in order to see that we're going to okay wait you're not seeing the book if you see table 1.2 of the of the textbook, you can see that uh, that distribution is is not exactly normal, but it's 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 skewed to the left, like the, the peak is further to the left, and and heavy tails means the the function is not does not exactly follow the the rule. So uh, lucky enough, we don't have to. We don't have to go for table 1.2 because it's here. So uh, the dotted line is a normal distribution curve. And uh, wait. Yeah. And our actual curve, our empirical return density. So, okay, this is well. So if we if we see if we if we see this two, it seems to us that um, our distribution is uh, the, the peak is way higher than in the than in the normal distribution. This means uh, we have a certain certain degree of deformation of that. Uh, wait. Okay, I will I will get into this definitely because it's interesting. This about this about this graph and other graphs. I will I will write in I will write in Canvas. Now, in order to to a demonstration of data analysis, we're going to be using uh, IBM stock returns from 1967 to 2008. And so, moving on, we have a normal random variable. If the if the if, if it's normal, okay. If the if it's not normal, but the the logarithm of that variable is normal, we will say that y is log normal. I mean, yeah, 
basically y is log normal if the logarithm of y is normal okay if that that it makes a bit more of sense uh, with the sound so the th the thing the, the thing with this is we can turn a normal distribution into a log normal distribution and back and it, and it can help a lot with calculations so if our variable x is normal with mean value mu and standard deviation and variance sigma squared then the exponential of x is log normal and it has the following mean and variance so it's it's fully determined in this case the, the expectation of the exponential is uh, the exponential of, of mu times sigma squared divided by 2 and the variance is this small monster over it, over it and conversely if y is log, is log normal with mean mu sub y and variance sigma y squared then the logarithm is normal with this this mean this variance okay if, if you if you take a look at it they kind of look like opposite from one another right What's the implication of this? I mean, if the log return of an asset is normally distributed with uh, this mean and this standard deviation, then what is the mean and standard deviation of its simple return? Uh, you, you're seeing it here, right? Log return, simple return, log normal distribution, normal distribution. So we're going to solve it, in, to solve it into steps. So base, based, of, uh, based on our return, we already know it's normally distributed the mean and variance of the exponential are exactly like this and now now simple return is the exponential of the corresponding log return minus one i mean y t minus one all right here we are using we are using these formulas so using this formula the the expectation of our simple return is the expectation of this exponential variable minus one okay there we go now about the variance they have the same variance and the standard deviation is basically the same and again i highly suggest you check the ibm stock returns in table 1.2 now, in order to in order to, to to see better how this how this process are considered, uh, we, we can we can go into the following chapters. So this is where different sections of time series analysis are t are taken are taken into account in this uh, in this calculation. This is this normality log normality. Uh, regular returns, log returns, is really important. As you as you can see here, we're basically going along the whole the whole textbook by using that. So this is this is a great cornerstone. I really need you to get a really good grasp on on this test. We need you to get a really good grasp on. On normality if you happen to have some problems there is a discussion thread on canvas which i will attend mostly daily all right so this number normality is a really it's a really important parameter in a in a random variable now uh, in order to in order for you to to get a bit more into it i need you to to take a look at chapter one and study the likelihood function of this return because it, it's going to be it's going to be important later on. Now, uh, if we have a marginal distribution, I mean any distribution and a distribution that is, uh, I'm sorry guys, I'm drinking water, and a distribution that is conditioned to it. 
we can build a distribution, uh, a two two very two variated distribution based on both. So this is the distribution function. And we multiply both and we get we get the two variable distribution. So for two consecutive returns, for example, we can build we can build this distribution function in this way. Yeah. I mean, this is not a distribution function. This is likelihood function for for those two. So the likelihood the likelihood function for them can be like this. We can we can iterate mostly, and we get all these big product of uh, conditioned functions. Now, now if this if this conditioned returns are normal, I mean, if we, if we can accept normality on this variable with this mean and this variance, then our likelihood function it can be calculated directly. I mean, a normal is a curve with an equation, so we can apply it here. And what we get is this product of normal curves times f of r1. For, however, for simplicity, we can just ignore f of r1 and consider it like this and we call this the conditional likelihood function of the of these returns of course under normality if we happen to if we happen to find heavy tails then there are different distributions that can that can help us with this but if our population happens to be normal under this condition then the likelihood function is great So, specifications. Uh, these two will be, these two will be discussed in, in different chapters. Uh, Musu Tao is discussed in chapter two, while uh, variance is discussed in chapters three and four. We will, we will get there along the, along the lectures, but not today. So, this likelihood function gives us a gives us an idea about dependence. So how can we quantify that? Okay, in order to quantify that, we are going to consider two variables, we'll call them x and y. And the first thing we have is Pearson's correlation coefficient. This is defined, this is defined pretty straightforward. Covariance of x and y, a standard deviation of x, a standard deviation of y. And the other one we have, which it could lead to confusion, so, so please be pretty sure to make, to make this difference between Pearson's correlation coefficient, which is only rho, and Kendall's tau, which is rho sub tau. And we are going to let uh, x with a hat and y with a hat be a random copy of this. So the Kendall's tau is the probability that the product of this difference is greater than zero minus the probability that the product of this difference is lesser than zero, aka this can be seen as the expectation of the sign of this. I mean, you know, the, the, the sign is a, is a function that takes value one if the, if the parameter is positive and value minus one if the parameter is negative. So that's it. This measure, this Kendall's tau, quantifies the probability of concordance over discordance in the data. Here, concordancy means uh, copies of x and y vary in the same direction, and discordant, well, the other way around. Now, for spherical distributions, for example, normal distribution, our, our Kendall tau is actually 
2 divided by pi times the arc sinus of the Pearson's correlation coefficient. This row is not random, this row is Pearson's correlation coefficient. So they're they're pretty they are pretty related. We can see this as well as uh, Pearson's correlation coefficient is the sinus of uh, pi divided by two times the Kendall tau, but actually Kendall tau is the, the hard one to compute. So in this case, this, this formulation is extremely convenient. Now we have another correlation coefficient, in this case, uh, Spearman's row, another row, please don't get them confused. So we're going to let f of x of x and f sub y of y be the cumulative distribution instead of the distribution function. So the, the correlation coefficient, I mean the Pearson's correlation coefficient of the cumulative distribution function is a Spearman's row. I mean, what I mean with this is it's the correlation coefficient of a probability transform variables. Okay, this was even less clear, right? Uh, yeah, it's the correlation coefficient of the ranks of the data, probability-wise. Now, uh, why do we consider measures of dependence? Well, first one, Pearson's correlation coefficients has problems with uh, non-spherical distributions, especially with non-normal distributions. And in risk management, this can mess up our measures for quite a lot and give us uh, some crazy predictions, really. Correlation coefficients focuses on linear dependence. This is not a no, this is on. It focuses on linear dependence. So if we have heavy outliers, uh, the correlation coefficient is going to be a bit messed up and not reflect really how the, how the variables are related. Finally, the actual rates of the correlation coefficients uh, can be much smaller than minus one one. I mean, funny enough, this is somewhere between minus one and one. So, uh, what do we want to take away from this lecture? In the first place, uh, some understanding of the summary statistics of asset returns. On the second place, the, some understanding of various definitions of returns and how are they related. This means net return, this means logarithmic return, and how they're related, like uh, one plus net return is e to the power of the logarithmic return. Basic characteristics of financial time series, Normality, skewness, kurtosis, moments, central moments, etc. And now for the basic R functions, I have left for you uh, a, really, a really nice R file on Canvas. I mean, since I cannot be there during, during practical lessons to supervise you on how you, on how you work with, uh, with the R, I have, I have left you and I have left you together with uh, the introduction and together with some lectures uh, corresponding R codes to make this uh, easier to follow. Uh, to me, best recommendation is that you follow these lectures together with uh, with the R codes. So at any moment you can you can pause me and run some code and see how it works and then go on. So. Moving on, I'm going to talk to you about linear time series. So uh, we can say that the financial time series is a collection of financial measurement over time. For example, we can do a time series with logarithmic return of IBM stocks or anything, right, that purpose. So let our data be a collection of T data points. We wonder what information those returns contain, actually. Like, yeah, well, it's a logarithm of a return of a quotient of prices or, okay. So let's, let's see, let, let's open it and see what information it has. So uh, first, first concept we have to understand is stationarity. 
a strictly stationary distribution is time invariant and a weak stationary distribution it's two first moments call them mean invariants not exactly variants but yeah are time invariant yeah variance is time invariant it sounds good right so in practice what does weak stationary mean really so in the past i mean yeah literally in the past consider the 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 time of the time series from one to t so the the time plot of the of the logarithm returns in the past varies around a fixed level and with an affinity range it's it's like an electrocardiogram really like this uh, this mean and variance uh, being being time independent means that the past part of the plot is mostly an electrocardiogram all right it goes between the term in ranges you can see it in some of the of the initial graphs and in the future the first two moments of the future are or the future logarithm uh, returns those that hasn't happened are the same as those of the data we have like skewness kurtosis and everything all those were the same so we can do some nice meaningful inference with that no, sorry now if we have a random variable of uh, logarithmic returns we have the mean the mean mu and the variance bar which we could call sigma squared as well but well notation luckily it's only notation so the mu is the the expectation or the mean of the variable and the variance is the second moment of rt minus the minus the mean now in order to do better estimates uh, we're going to be using sample mean and sample variance instead of regular mean or regular variance okay so we will use this one here here instead of dividing by t we divide by t by t minus one it, it also is a big asset if our variable has only one value but well in this case uh, we're going to run um, a student t test in which our null hypothesis is that the average is zero versus alternative hypothesis which is the average is not zero uh, we compute this uh, this t a student t parameter in which the numerator is sample mean this is regular mean as well you know arithmetic mean from school and the denominator is the square root of variance divided by the sample size divided by t and so we compare this t value with uh, normal zero one with the table so our our test will make we will make us uh, reject our null hypothesis of zero mean if the absolute value of this parameter is greater than the corresponding value for the normal distribution or if the p value is less than the significance level So another parameter we have to consider is the auto covariance uh, with lag. I mean lagged covariance. I mean what is the what's the covariance between a variable that measures these returns and a, and a variable that measures uh, returns k months away? Well, in this case we are we are applying the same formula, and we have the 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 the, the, ex, the expectation of this product. I mean rt minus their average and rt minus k minus their mean i mean the average their mean which is the same because they're part of the same of the same random variable in any case so uh, in order to talk of autocorrelations we're going to define this rho sub l uh, look that 
everything that is related to autocorrelation is denominated with letter rho. In this case, P sub L is the covariance of RT with RT minus L divided by the variance. Now, uh, we would note that rho sub zero is one. This is because the covariance of a variable with itself is regular variance. And rho sub k is rho sub minus k for, for k, k different to zero. And I want you to tell me why. Yep. So uh, in review session of lecture one, we will we will see this. So it, it, will, it will be nice if you can if you can take a look at it. Now uh, existence of trivial correlations implies that the return is predictable. A predictable return indicates the market is not exactly efficient in the sense that it's not exactly working as in, um, okay, how can I explain this? Um, yeah, it, it speaks about the certain cyclical character of the, of the market, that's, so, that's something that shouldn't happen. Now, um, speaking of correlation, we're going to find, this is a concept that is going to appear all over the place, all over the course, which is a sample autocorrelation function, ACF. You will be seeing ACF all across all, and it's this function. It's the product of RT minus the minus the corresponding sample mean with RT plus L minus the sample mean, which is basically the same because they're the same variable, from time moment one to time moment time my t minus l, and here we put the variance times t. No, the, the variance is the is the second moment, so it's basically this sum divided by t. So, but yeah, this is the this is ACF. You'll get along super well. Now, uh, market efficiency can be can be tested as well. So, if we don't have serial correlations between our variables, that is actually an efficiency marker, and we can take a, a test like this, for example, calling as a null hypothesis rho one equals zero versus our alternative hypothesis, rho, rho 1, this rho here, is different, 0. And we have our param parameter p in this way, which is uh, p1 times square root of t. And this is similar to a normal 0, 1. So we can reject our null hypothesis if either this this small t is bigger in absolute value than the corresponding value of the normal distribution of or if p value is smaller than significance level now for a little more powerful one we're going to to check u box statistics null hypothesis all these rows of l are zero alternative hypothesis some rho sub y is different of zero, mostly. So the function q sub m, t, t plus two, and this sum of all the, of all sample autocorrelation functions divided by t minus l, this, this sum of a squared functions is, is a t squared. It has a t squared distribution, m degrees of freedom, and so we will reject our, our null hypothesis if the value we get in our t squared is bigger than what we should, or if the p value is smaller than the significance level. Now, there are several explanations for serial correlations in financial time series, 
we will see them in chapters three and five, but they are but they are basically they are basically three. First one being risk premium, we will see in chapter three. And from chapter five, we have bid and ask bounds, where you know these these bits that kind of never end and repeat cyclically, and non-synchronous trading. That's that's also an important source of serial correlation. Thus, this uh, actually means that the autocorrelation function does not imply market inefficiency. It's only a marker that that says that there could be market inefficiency and if, if there is it might be due to that which means uh, not having market inefficiency is um, i mean if um, passing these tests Mostly, mostly means that we have no market inefficiency, but not passing them does not imply there is market inefficiency. This is a necessary condition, more of. So, for an example, we're going to go to monthly returns of IBM stock in the period 1926 to 1997. Regular returns. We have here logarithmic returns. We have here, and um, we have to wonder one thing now. We haven't we haven't stopped um, we haven't stopped really into the into it. But what is p value? I mean, um, when you set a significance level on a test, it means that you're you are looking. Uh, to see if your distribution falls in the in an interval of the curve such that the probability of it being out is lesser or equal than the significance level. I mean, if the if the p-value, which is what the which is what the test gives you, uh, p-value is the measure the probability that the yeah. It gives it gives you somehow the probability that the um, what's the word the probability in which corresponding region the variable can be. It's some sort of a significance a significance level as well. So if the p value is smaller than the than the significance level, it means uh, that the area of the curve in which the test is telling you your variable falls is actually bigger than where you want it to fall. So you have to reject that it is there. On the opposite side, if, if the p-value is bigger than the significance level, it means that the, re that the region of the curve that the test says you are into is a smaller than the, than the area your significance level uh, determines. And that means you can 100% assure you are into the area determined by your significance level, and so you accept uh, null hypothesis. Okay, this is a, this is a complicated one. Like p-value can be really cryptic. Please don't be afraid to ask. This has been, uh, well, th this was a nightmare for a couple of uh, courses in statistics. But uh, yeah, uh, it, it's, it's mostly what it is. Uh, if I remember correctly, R always gives you p-value back unless you ask for the, for, the, for the significance interval. So, you, so in order to do a good analysis, you just have to compare p-value with the significance level you have set and thus I mean, p-value is smaller, reject null hypothesis, p-value is greater, accept it. That's mostly it. And it also implies that, I mean, this example implies that our monthly IBM stocks do not have serial correlations. 
the reason the reason here being p values actually no mm. yeah i have to delete this this last 10 seconds so uh, we're going to we're going to check another examples uh, moderators of crsp value weighted index from 1926 to 1997 these are box parameter are very high they are very high like this this is huge for a t squared with n degrees of freedom really so if we if we now set a certain significance level and then and then compare with the with the corresponding tables for for t square we will see that these values are actually huge which means we have to we have to reject our null hypothesis that there are that there are no non null uh, correlations serial correlations okay this this, this gets a bit uh, tongue twister to to pronounce anyway now uh, these serial correlations could be explained by many things between them uh, non synchronous trading for example could be other reasons as well but if we check uh, equal weighted index returns we have mostly the same and this is a really this is something i have the r code here so i will i will share it with you uh, along along the week otherwise you can you can just check it by yourself and we can look at it in the review session for lecture one that's one of the things i'm thinking of um, of considering this case back to this example of the monthly returns of ibm stock these these values are not too big really. So mm -hmm. okay. So one thing are going to we are going to be using a lot, and I mean a lot is backshift or lag uh, this is this will be defined by a by a b or by an l and it, it doesn't mean it's multiplying by anything or it's a power of an index uh, b squared of rt means rt backshifted twice like the the backshift of the, of the backshift of rt which means taking picking up rt and taking a back step which brings us into rt minus one and then taking a back step from there which turns us into rt minus two i mean either b or l are the same they mean time shift back so here uh, you should not have any problem any problem really saying that uh, r2 is minus 0 0.005 b of r3 is actually r2 which is minus 0 0.005 and b squared from r5 is r543 which is minus 0 0.014 question what is b2 b2 uh, is an operator that means go two returns uh, back yeah it, it lags it's like a yeah it, it, it drags the 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 return several steps back now uh, we have seen a lot of statistics a lot of information a lot of tests you might be thinking wow this is a lot for lecture one okay you're right but what are important statistics in practice so we're going to we're going to see that unconditional amounts are not as important as conditional ones because especially in economics 
things don't happen without a reason. The reason it could be a man picking up money from a box, it could be other things, but generally things are tied to other things. So we're going to pick up this data, this collection of, um, of logarithmic returns and call it f to minus one. This return can be decomposed in two parts. One is a predictable part, a part that can be read through our models, plus a part that cannot be read through, throughout our models. I mean, that, let's say, conditional part. I mean, this, uh, this element is kind of a sum of things. So if we have this, this information, f t minus 1, which is the collection of uh, all the returns before moment t, moment t can be seen as the as the average of this uh, of this expression plus this product here, this sigma t and epsilon t. We're going to, we're going to see what that means here. Uh, most of t is a conditional conditional mean of a variable. I mean, we have we have talked about conditional distribution before. A t is is a, is a shock. We, we we'll call it shock. We'll call it innovation. It's generally something that comes from outside. Now epsilon t or e sub t is an IID sequence with mean zero and variance one, which is mostly a normal normalizing parameter, mostly. And uh, the sigma sub t is what we're going to call a conditional standard deviation. I mean, the standard deviation of the variable rt conditioned to ft minus 1. I mean, the standard deviation of our variable conditioned to all the previous values. This in finance is called volatility. And this, this is basically uh, a mean plus volatility times uh, basically a normal, a normal distribution, a normal sequence. So the different traditional time series modeling is very concerned with, uh, with this mean, with this mu sub t. It's called the mean equation, but volatility modeling is the part that conserves sigma sub t. In this case, uh, the model for sigma squares of t, we will, be, we will be calling volatility equation. We will be using a lot of that. And in general, a univariate time series analysis serves a double purpose. The first one, uh, give us a model for, for the predictable part, for the mean, for mu sub t, and the second purpose is given understanding of our models for sigma square. Uh, what properties they have? How can we get into that? How can we use them to to forecast future returns? All that. Now, the most basic time of type of time series is linear time series. Uh, pretty, pretty intuitively. Uh, time series is linear if the predictable part is linear, a linear function of the of the previous values, and the a sub t, the the volatility part, are are independent and have the same distribution. That's what we would call IID, independent and identically distributed. So in the case of the in the case of this of this e sub t, we have independent and identically distributed sequence of things. It, this this makes it possible to model with them actually. Now uh, mathematically speaking, we can say that R t is basically a mean, I mean a constant mu, and a sum of uh, coefficients, any coefficients really, where the first of all is exactly one, 
because you know otherwise you can't guarantee that RT is an identically equal to to the mean, and then all this modeling thing is uh, kind of purposeless. Actually, and this uh, this ATs is a sequence of variables that are identical and independent and identically distributed with mean zero and well-defined distribution. This is this is pretty big, but still quite a big improvement. Now, in economic literature, you will read AT as the shock or innovation and the coefficients uh, phi sub y, psi sub y, actually are the are named impulse or responses of um, of return in time t. Now, um, all this, all this sum part, this this a sub t, uh, we will we will be calling them as well. Uh, I mean, if if instead of uh, variance one, we we ask the a sub t to have a finite variance, this is what we are going to be calling white noise because if you remember correctly, we haven't demanded the the a sub t to have variance equal to one, but instead to be well defined. So we, we will call this we will call this white noise. So basically a return in time t is the average, I mean a constant plus white noise. Now there are a lot of models. Uh, actually in lecture two we will dedicate we will dedicate to one, two and I think three. First one, autoregressive models, second one moving average models, third one, ARMA models, which uh, basically are a linear combination of both, or some type of combination in which you can get the best of both worlds. Then you have se seasonal models, regression models with errors, and then fractional difference models. I don't know if we will have time for that, but those are really interesting because they have really long memory. Now, for an example, uh, the quarterly growth rate of U.S. real gross national product seasonally adjusted for the second quarter of 1947 to the first quarter of 1991. And AR3, we call it autoregressive model. Uh, it's basically a linear, com where the, the, the linear combination is uh, just th th this type of coefficient. You, you, only depend of, uh, you only depend on as many coefficients as, as this number as this number dictates plus a coefficient a sub t. That is a one noise with variance like this. So we given given r sub n r sub n minus one and r sub n minus two. Yeah, you can you you can use it to break r sub n minus one for any n. Basically, what what you need is the previous value. 2 times g4 and 3 times g4. And so we can directly put this into the model and say, you have this plus this plus this plus this. Okay, this is pretty easy to work with, really. So who can, who can say other implications of the model without looking at the textbook yet? We will discuss that uh, in depth in lecture two, which is dedicated to, to R, MA, and ARMA models. Now, uh, in this course, we basically use statistical methods to find model that fits the data well enough so that inference, aka prediction, can be done. I mean, we are trying to use, to, to build things that are well built enough uh, for us to talk about how the future could be. On the other hand, there is economic theory that leads to time series models for economic variables. Like there, there are certain models. For example, you have the real business cycle theory in macroeconomics, which we can we can simplify and explain it in in one uh, in one line. We can show that uh, we have this this GDP output. But we can find that the, the logarithm of that output follows an AR2 model. I mean, it's basically 
uh, a model like this but without this parameter so it's really this is really the this is really the foundation of this so in order to do, to to see that in more detail i'll recommend you visit this this book we are not following them we are not following it i mean but it's, it's quite interesting as well so you can see how this is how this is applied in in one go and we're going to finish with uh, with a couple of examples this one monthly simple return of center for research in security prices crsp our index is is uh, determined in in this way where with the with the standard deviation of of a of the volatility being like this uh, we pick the, re the residual series a sub t we can build it into into the q into the q model before where was it here we can we can run this this uh, this test over it and so we get a not so bad value really so I really want you to to tell me whether or not we should accept that this has uh, serial correlations or not. Like I will I will ask about that on Monday. So um, there is a difference between statistical significance and economic significance. I mean, statistical significance uh, basically is going to help us determine whether or not um, our prediction falls into our model or if it falls into a model we can work with while economic significance well it has uh, it, it has other implications in this course we should discuss some reasons for the observed serial dependency index return there will be a thread on canvas on lecture one and that's where the discussion is going to take place. You can you can post at any you can post at any time. You can post pictures of your reasoning, whatever. You, know, you can see, for example, chapter five on non-synchronous trading. This would help uh, explain this serial dependence in a pretty clear way. So, in a quick recap, a model has four important properties: stationarity, I mean invariance over time. Three basic properties: main, variance, and serial dependence. Third, empirical model building is building mostly three parts: specification, estimation, and checking. Remember, please, the checking part because it's extremely important. And the fourth one is how we can use that to, to forecast or to see the future in that sense. So yeah, that was that was basically it. I really hope you found you found it interesting. There is a thread in Canvas in which you can, in which you can uh, give feedback, suggest improvements, or anything really that, that you think about this. If you, for future lectures you would rather just follow the slides instead of listening to me, uh, please please be sure to tell to tell me in advance. In any case, I plan to I plan to record all lectures. So in any case, you can you can choose whether or not you want. Uh, you want to to listen to it or on the opposite side you just prefer to read it at your pace i don't understand that okay this has been this has been it i will see you on wednesday